I'll, I'll work on the Facebook group live while you guys are starting to answer questions. Here's how we're going to start. I'd like to, um, for each of you to introduce yourself. Many people know you all, and, but some may not. So there's a, a large audience here. So I'd like you each, so I'll, I'll say your name, and then I'm going to have you say in 60 seconds, um, please uh, give us your introduction. I'm going to start with Ben Lapkus. Hi, everyone. Neil, Anna, thanks for having me. Hunter, awesome to hang out with you again. I'm the, uh, the host of the national trade event, the best real estate investing conference for commercial real estate syndicators. We just had ours whew, right before the coronavirus kicked off in late February. I'm also the uh, director of acquisitions and finance for Spartan Investment Group. I drive investment finance and corporate finance. We are a syndication investment development firm for self-storage is our focus. We buy and we build self-storage, but we've also... Um, purchased RV parks. We are developing a mobile home community. We own a car wash. So we do some other stuff, but proactively we're mostly storage. Awesome. And next, Hunter Thompson. How's it going, everyone? Hunter Thompson, managing principal of ASIM Capital. That's A-S-Y-M Capital. Uh, real honor to be on. I really appreciate it, guys. I, there's a lot of talk in the real estate business about kind of sharing information and kind of being one of those people that's not as competitive and all this, but it's usually just talk. The people that you're looking at right now are actually about that life. Like, I just wanted to mention that up front. You'll see why coming up here in just a little bit, but I'm one of those guys that I want to put the best speakers in front of the most people and add as much value. And I know Neil and, and Anna are about that as well. And obviously Ben is as well. So anyway, short introduction. Uh, we joint venture with operating partners and act as a capital raising arm and investor relations arm across a variety of asset classes, which we can talk about. Uh, okay. Thank you, Hunter. And next I give you Mr. Neil Bawa. Hey guys. Um, uh, syndicator, um, educator. I love all things multifamily. My friends call me the mad scientist of multifamily because I'm always focused on the number and the data and the analytics of multifamily. And, and right now, actually, I'm spending more time on the analytics of coronavirus and its, mm -hmm. it's, uh, its curves uh, than I am spending on, on multifamily itself. But um, very curious to see what our audience, audience wants to talk about today and, and, and also get uh, feedback both on the equity side from Hunter and his investors and on the, you know, on the development side with what Ben is up to. So super excited to be here. Um, okay, I'm, this, I'll give you a quick intro of me. My name is Anna Myers. I am a business partner with Neil Bawa, which means I am a professional cat herder. Yes, I, for, <laughs> for, for my daily life, I herd people and data, and uh, we make wonderful things happen with that combination of magic that we produce at Grow Capitus and Multifamily U. And without further ado, I am going to get into the questions. Now, we are going to start with questions about jobs because that's a, on everybody's mind right now like what happens when no one is working how does that work so neil i'm going to start out with you what happens to real estate if this many people lose their jobs uh, what's going to happen if they're out of work for two or three months or four months well it really depends on whether they are actually out of work so while it's clear that our unemployment rate just shot up, uh, the, the national level unemployment rate was 3.5% before coronavirus and is somewhere between 9.5% 9, 9 and 12.5% today, right? So wow. it's, it's shot up to an insane level. The question is, does the government really consider these people to be unemployed and what level of unemployment benefits will they have access to? While these things are very new, it is very obvious that a massive amount of money is being injected into the system to make these people almost believe that they're not unemployed yeah. because the, the companies that they're working for are receiving massive benefits to keep these people on the payroll and to furlough them as opposed to um, letting them go. And so what is the honest answer is that it is unclear today what the nation's unemployment rate is, something that we've never had in history before. No one knows how many of these people are truly considered unemployed because a lot of employers are still continuing to pay salaries, even though a, a lot of these people have been furloughed. But I think the, the true answer to your question is that if these people are unemployed for 60 days, then the impact on, on real estate is extremely pale, painful and extremely short. If these people are unemployed for four or five months, then the impact is unbelievably painful and, and much longer. And I don't mean four months, it, it could be significant number of years. 
you know, the impact could be uh, very strong on real estate. So I think the big question in my mind is, are they unemployed for 60 days or are they unemployed for 150 days? Because 150 days is true gloom and doom for real estate. 60 days, um, I'm, I'm not really worried about it at all. Um, ben Hunter, do either one of you want to jump in on that? Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I, I would mostly agree with Neil. I, was, uh, I, I come from New York City originally, and so I've got a lot of friends there who either are sick or have been directly impacted or have fr uh, family that's there. And um, that was the f one of the first places after Seattle, obviously, and some of the, the Pacific Northwest to get shut down. And so got a, a few friends that still uh, live their lives as servers or, or bartenders, yeah. and uh, they're completely out. So um, when I heard the 3.3 million number, and I kind of surveyed my friends or my network via Instagram or Facebook or just virtual happy hours. Um, I wasn't as surprised perhaps as some others. I, I saw that uh, as uh, a little bit lower than I would have expected. Um, I know that Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are looking at the end of Q2 is somewhere between 24 to 30% unemployment. Um, but ben, I, you're I, multiplying. I would, I would really, what's that? You're multiplying. There's multiple Wait. bends coming in the room. There's, uh -oh. there's a, <laughs> There's three bands, but yeah. that's okay. Only one's talking, so let's keep going. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I would agree with Neil in that some of those friends are still being paid or their jobs are still there as soon as the, uh, the establishment reopens. And so there's, there are some, kind, we see all these stories in the news about um, firms that only, barber shops that only have one month of rent. Uh, but there are some longer standing institutions that have seen things like this before. There are hundred year old restaurants and um, they have some three, four, five, six months of operating capital if they've downsized completely, to just kind of shut down and reopen. So I, I agree with Neil that we have no idea what the unemployment rate is going to look like in four months. Um, Hunter, which sectors of real estate do you think will be affected first? If we are, you know, if, what do you think is going to happen first if these people don't have jobs? You know, I think that the first thing that we have to address is just for people that are extremely data driven, right now is a really uncertain time. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. generally speaking, data tends to lag. You have to have the data before you can report the data, obviously. But especially right now, it's a massive question mark. I mean, we're talking about speculating on the unemployment rate, but that is a speculation in itself in terms of whether these companies will continue to pay. So for someone like myself, it's a very challenging time to kind of front run data that tends to lag by a quarter or two quarters. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a massive question mark. And I think that a part of this as well is the mentality. There is a mentality around typical recessions, which is that there's this uncertainty around how far it's going to go and how deep it can go and what it really means and how many months it's going to take and this and that and the other thing. This is different. The mentality is like this problem is very specific. And if this problem wasn't around, everything would be solved. Yeah. That's also very unique to this situation. So as an example, it's like if there was a cure and then everyone had access to it, we'd be going back to business as normal. From a mental standpoint, that's very different than an entire nation trying to delever all at once, right? Which is kind of what happened in 2008. So as far as real estate is concerned, you know, I'm looking at the hotel business. That business operates on very thin margins and they're getting absolutely crushed. I'm sure you've seen the, the statistics about Marriott and Hyatt and things just firing or kind of quasi laying off their people. That's something that I'm going to anticipate happening more and more. I mean, we're contemplating putting on an event in January, and it's very challenging to get any type of event insurance right now, let alone oh, yeah. insurance regarding coronavirus, which is exactly right. what everyone wants right now, right? So it's really interesting. I would also take really a look wrong. at, yeah, that's right. It's, it's a challenging time for anyone in the event business. My, my wife who's in the other room has a corporate event planning company, so everything's just totally on a question mark and a standstill. I think that the cell storage business, which I'm sure Ben is very happy to hear and agrees with, is um, going to produce very solid returns during this time because you're not supposed to actually go to the facility. So right. I mean, you're supposed to go there twice, once when you drop off your stuff, once when you pick up your stuff. Um, when I look at multifamily, I think over the long term, we're very well positioned in that sector, but particularly in the, the class C, class D areas, um, these people typically have two months, or excuse me, two weeks to a month of expenses that they can pay. So continually floating month after month is very, very challenging. I'm sure we can get into more details there, but that's just what I'm looking at. At the end of the day, real estate itself lags. We haven't had to pay rent once in this environment yet. So May 1st right. is a very important date. April 1st is very important as well. Yeah. 
Um, well, speaking about um, markets, uh, let's talk about oil. Uh, mm -hmm. Ben, this is a question for you. Mm -hmm. What the heck is happening in the oil market? And how will that impact real estate in markets, Texas markets, for example? Um, I think Midland Odessa is an area that you're invested in. Yeah, so we, we own, Spartan Investment Group owns two RV parks in the Modessa area, Midland Odessa area, West Texas, Permian mm -hmm. Basin. Um, there's a couple of interesting things. It's, it's, it's a wild ride. I mean, it's always a wild ride in oil, but especially right now yeah. what's going on in, in Modessa. So uh, it, obviously it was, the, it was the first to get hit massively with this pandemic, and it was just exacerbated by Russia and Saudi Arabia going after a price war um, that has negatively impacted pricing here. Um, but with everybody staying at home, nobody flying, nobody trucking around, uh, people consuming less, um, I, I saw that, uh, I think it was, it was Asia has had 40% less pollutants in the last 30 days than the previous 30 days. I mean, that's a massive change um, right. that directly impacts oil. Unfortunately, right. we, we have RV parks, so we're, we're tied to the oil industry, but we're not directly invested in oil. So we're seeing a lot of layoffs. Mm -hmm. That's not ununique. Um, you know, the, there's a boom and bust cycle, micro boom and bust cycles where companies will stand up and, and fall down uh, in, in a 30 day period of time, 120 day period of time. But we're definitely struggling with occupancy. Uh, mm -hmm. Folks are moving out, oil being at $20 a barrel, that's well below break even point. But at the same time, we're seeing some interesting shifts that could affect things three, six, nine, 12 months from now. Number one, uh, being billionaires, hedge fund operators, seeing energy at a, you know, 25 cents on the dollar, sometimes lower with bankruptcy companies. We might see some innovation come into play in three to six, nine months from now, after they start buying up all these oil companies that are going bankrupt and injecting new life into them. And the second thing, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the second thing is, is the Permian Basin is um, being looked at as, as a huge, um, uh, energy source for natural gas, and there's more focus being shifted Permian Basin for natural gas. So, from a in, in a uh, in employment standpoint and um, uh, occupancy at our parks, we're sitting around 40, 50 percent occupancy right now. I mean, wow. it, like people move out right away. Wow. Uh, but we, I wouldn't be surprised if 12 months from now we were back at 100 percent with 50 percent. Uh, rent increases from where we are today. Um, right. it, it just the cycle moves so quickly there. So mm -hmm. fortunately, we capitalized in a way where we've got a upwards of a 30%, almost a 40% reversion cap rate on mm -hmm. our purchase price. Uh, we're debt free and we know how to kind of downsize and, and act efficiently. So we're not struggling yet, but we're not stoked about performance either. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to add, Anna, there is that just like you know, when a bank goes out of business, their customers always get bought out by somebody else. The oil industry is like that. You know, if you shut down your shale well, somebody is going to come in and buy that shale well. And as soon as the price of oil goes above a minimum bound, they're going to reopen it. So yeah. you know, exactly right. oil is one of those things that you you know the reason you have boom and bust cycles is that every single boom bust is a is an opportunity for new capital to come in and take over. And, and there's a value to every single, you know, or every single, uh, you know, oil well that has been dug and it's only a matter of time before it goes back up. So I, I'm, I'm bullish on oil in the long term, in the short term and the mid term, I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I, I will say the biggest risk in oil today or in energy use as a whole, non-renewable risk, is if this lifestyle that we are just starting to see today mm -hmm. becomes the new status quo. If we reduce our commute times, if we reduce our travel and we just start camping more into perpetuity over the next five to 10 years, we'll yeah. reduce demand for energy to the point that renewable energy can accommodate, which is a good thing for the planet. It's Maybe a good not thing for, for the my planet. particular investment, but I, I certainly wouldn't be uh, upset with that. Uh, long don't, don't hold your breath, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but again, I'm, I'm not really holding my breath. I think as soon as this is over with, you know, we'll be back and at it and consuming more energy than, than we could have ever thought possible. I mean, just with uh, mining cryptocurrency, we undid all of the effects renewable energy had over the last decade. So yeah. I, I, just can, I see us continuing to use more energy than, than, than we can produce renewably in the long run. Um, oh, okay. So what other jobs or markets should be considered risky as real estate investors? Uh, Neil, you have a, a class that you that you put together, an amazing um, way of looking at markets called location magic is what you call it. Mm -hmm. Well, how does this pandemic change the way we assess markets and neighborhoods to invest in? 
what well, it depends is on the magic here yeah it depends on whether you want to invest today right um, you know in my case most of the most of my investments i'm pushing them out 45 days into the future so we can kind of assess to see where things are unless there are things like storage which uh, as so many people have already mentioned the storage industry doesn't appear to have any challenges associated with this particular downturn um, so when, when we're looking at these 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 areas i'm more inclined at this point to look at everything from a bargain perspective. I want to see where there are bargains in the marketplace as opposed to necessarily looking at markets that have, you know, the usual, the, the, the job growth, the income growth, the population growth. So I'm more inclined to look at that because I believe that in Q3 of this year, we're going to see some incredible bargains, right? Yes, you know, let's, let's assume for a moment that we don't end up with 6 million people dead in the US. You, we end up with 50,000 dead, which is, you know, similar to what the flu season of 2018. In that scenario, even in that scenario, it's very, very likely that we will have a certain number of defaults happen in the single family market, the multifamily market, the office market, and no question in my mind that there will be defaults in the hotel market because yeah. they, they operate on, on such thin margins. So at the moment, my mindset is not necessarily of, let me invest in the best cities in the US because I don't look at this as a, I don't look at this like 2008, 2001. I look at this as a category six hurricane that is simultaneously striking 196 countries. And so at the end of that category six hurricane, and it's not a three day long event, it's a, it's a three month long event. At the end of that time, fundamentally it doesn't change underlying asset value. So if, if, if you see a place like, let's say Memphis, and you start seeing 30 or 40% off you know, deals there, but then you see a place like Phoenix, which you know fundamentally is much stronger than Memphis, but you only see a 3% reduction. I'm more inclined at this point to go after the Memphis deal than to go after the Phoenix deal. So oh. <laughs> breaking my own rules, uh, but, but for the moment, I, I believe that it's, it's the deals that you have to look at. I mean, I bought $15,000 in Boeing stock yesterday at, a, at $146 a share. Because I fundamentally believe that at this point, it, there's no reason why Boeing should be down 66% from where it used to be, right? Because I see, I, I'm a data guy, I, and I'm tracking coronavirus data in, a, in an almost fanatic way, right? Like three, four yeah. times a day, I'm looking at where, where are we bending the curve? So I could spend an hour talking about every country and every state in the union where we're bending the curve successfully. So I think we, we beat this thing. We are going to beat it. I, I couldn't have said that last week, but I know for this, this week for sure that we're going to beat this. If we beat this, then Boeing isn't worth one third of what it used to be. In the same way, you know, Memphis or some of the other places that were not super powerful uh, places, um, you, you should look at them if there's deals there. At the same time though, places like Houston that have massive you know, population growth are markets that we should definitely be looking at because that population growth is such an insane driver of real estate profits that we cannot forget things like that. Um, Hunter, I would like you to compare and contrast this crisis with 2008 and 2001. What, how does this compare to the past bumps in the road that we've had? Sure. So it's interesting, right? I think like real estate investors and entrepreneurs just generally over the last five years, for sure, every conversation that you've had with someone, if it's longer than 10 minutes, mm -hmm. the question is, when is there going to be a next correction? When is there going to be a next yeah. opportunity? And because of that, everyone listening to this webinar is emotionally much more prepared to deal with this. And so you need to be sympathetic. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. other people that are around, this is completely blindsiding. If you're a really smart dentist, for example, imagine every, t you know, dentist conversations, every conversation they have doesn't have to do with a recession. Everyone on this webinar, it's probably true. So that's the first thing I want to point out. The second thing is when it comes to comparing 2008, 2010 or 2000 today, you see that so much of the economy has to do with real estate because real estate can determine how that massive tailwind can happen. So if you're a real estate owner, for example, you own a retail center and the tenants stop paying rent. You want to be able to provide them with flexibility because you want to keep your cash flow stream in place. What happens though, is if the tenants stop paying, you then may have to go to the bank and say, Hey, I'd like to keep this real estate, but we're having problem at the tenant level. The bank, similarly, they want to keep their cash flow stream, which is the real estate owner. They don't want to foreclose. They're a bank, not a real estate operator. What we saw in 2008, was a situation was there was a massive liquidity crunch, which allowed for no flexibility. 
If you're a real estate owner, you had to evict. If you were a property owner, you had to, if you were a bank, you had to foreclose. It didn't matter if you had to sell for 30% of the market value of the property. All you wanted to do was get liquidity. I'm not seeing that take place in today's market because there's a massive amount of liquidity. And I'll, I'll kind of circle back to a really important point there. Mm -hmm. The main thing that you want to be cautious about is in life and in economics, there tends to be this one, two punch situation where how many times have you heard the story where, you know, I was doing fine, but then I lost my business and then I got in a car wreck and that's all she wrote. I haven't able to been able to recover since then. Same thing is true with the economy. You've got the dot-com bubble happened. Okay. Then 9-11 happened. And that's really when things got nasty for the economy. Okay. The housing bubble happened. And then the global financial crisis happened. That's when things really got nasty. So what I want people to understand is that your emotional preparedness should be for the one-two punch. We can overcome coronavirus. Like this can happen. Like we've been through challenging situations before. So recalibrate what you're prepared to see in this space. A lot of people have been talking about the massive and overwhelming corporate debt bubble. Prior to the coronavirus, many econo economists would likely have predicted that the corporate debt would have caused the major, major problems in the market today. If coronavirus continues and we cannot solve this problem, the corporate debt bubble is going to be presented with a massive, massive hurdle that could actually issue in a serious liquidity crunch. So the big comparison there is that we're not in that situation now. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the flexibility to maintain their position, but watch out for the one-two punch, whether it's in your personal life or in terms of economics. Very well said. I, I just wanted to add one piece to that, and that is that I think that the Federal Reserve completely agrees with what Hunter just said. And so the Fed is now making public announcements that they will start buying corporate debt, something that the Fed has never done before. But they're saying, we want to create a liquid market for corporate debt. And so we're going to start going out and buying corporate debt. And we're going to start with these big stable companies, you know, like Boeing and, and GM, you know, GM. But then we are going to actually go into the, the kind of the sketchier market with the mid companies. And we're going to start buying their debt. So I, I think they see it exactly your way, Hunter. And I think that they're, the Fed's looking forward and saying, this could become a problem. We don't want a one-two punch here. Let's somehow not have that second punch come in. And so I, I do think that they're taking aggressive measures. measures. So I ben, a, I think you've got some ideas on that one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more of a question because I, so I read a news article yesterday about, about the, um, how the Fed is actually going to produce the liquidity for the corporate uh, debt second punch uh, that, that Hunter just very eloquently described uh, the potential of it. And, and I, I'm seeing this as like an alphabet soup of potential, <laughs> potential um, issues. I don't know if anybody saw this Yahoo Finance article where the Fed is not actually allowed to make any of these loans directly to these corporations. So the Treasury is setting up special purpose vehicles that the Fed is financing and the Treasury is taking that and making decisions on what to do with it, which is only precedented with a very small amount of the Obama administration, but it wasn't abused. And right. so there's a huge potential for this power of the executive branch to take all of these funds, trillions of dollars of liquidity, and do what it wants and potentially play favorites with it in the, in, in, in across the U.S. I'm curious as to how, how you guys might think uh, this could change the U.S. landscape of corporate cronyism in politics. I don't think anybody's really paying attention to the how this is being done and, and what some of the long-term ramifications could be socio-politically. I think it's going to create the same kind of backlash that, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street did. I, I do think that corporate cronyism will occur. I do think that they'll end up giving money to some companies that don't need them. Um, we're, we're a little better off than last time, but where we saw that, you know, the, the Wall Street CEOs, their bonuses didn't get cut, even though they took hundreds of billions of dollars. So we're slightly better off. This time we've got, you know, stuff in, the, in this bill that prevents that. For example, Donald Trump can't take money for his own hotels, even though yeah. I'm sure they're highly distressed. So I think we're learning a little bit from 2008. Having said that, I think that there's going to be misuse. But my question is, for the greater good, does it still make sense to do it knowing that there's going to be some misuse uh, that comes with, with every weapon, but if you don't do this and that second punch comes in and this actually turns into a real recession as opposed to a sharp we down and a sharp we up, you know, question is, was it worth it? I don't know. I, have I can 
people either. But it's something I was going to say, I think Hunter's got some thoughts there. Okay. All right. <laughs> I can chime in. I was so excited when I saw some of these topics come across because it's rare that we get to talk about these quasi-political kind of economic discussions because people try to toe the line and that's um, part of that it's in people's best interest to do so. But at the end of the day, it leaves you with an incomplete view of what people actually think. You know, and so, you know, I wanted to talk about this for a long time, but from my perspective, the reason that we have this massive corporate debt bubble is because of the incredibly low interest rate environment, which has been created by the Fed's actions leading out of 2008. And so what has happened is that in order to facilitate a, a rebound of the economy from the housing market, the interest rates are artificially low, not only in the United States, but globally. And so it made the cost of capital to borrow much, much, much more lower. So for example, uh, junk bonds used to be you know, 10% range. Now they're 5% range. That's or 3%. How. Or 3%, exactly. So that's why companies have been able to borrow and borrow and borrow and still service their debt because the interest rates are low. It's an incredible moral hazard to, to create this and to go down this path and to make the next bubble larger and larger and larger. And I do want to talk about how we can participate as investors while still knowing that this is a moral hazard. I think the yeah. old adage is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Well, you know, I'm not going to be on the losing side of that spectrum, right? I'm going to participate intelligently knowing what's going on. But, you know, if you're asking for my stimulus package, it's really simple. Let's abandon and abolish the FDA, Let's completely abolish the IRS. Let's take away the Federal Reserve and have a, a competitive environment where currencies can compete and see if that doesn't solve the problem as opposed to, it's like the Simpsons thing where the guy has a beard and his beard is stuck in the pencil sharpener and he, he sharpens the pencil and his beard gets closer and he's like, that doesn't work. Okay, I'll sharpen it further. And that's it. So he's just- Right, his, his, his closer and closer. closer. Yeah, exactly. Um, the tools that the government have is not only limited to fiscal policy and monetary policy. Those are the tools that they want to pull. There are other tools such as deregulation of industries. And we're seeing this happen where the FDA is saying, okay, now it's actually serious. Rich people can get this virus. Let's remove this red tape for a second and new viruses are going to be brought to market much more quickly. That's very, very telling from my perspective. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's go on to uh, the apartment industry and a little bit of self-storage thrown in there as well. This is a question for Hunter and Neil. Um, you can take turns on this. Where do you see most of the financial strain in the apartment industry? Is it class A, B, C, or D? Which is gonna get hit the most? Well, I think so far, from what I'm seeing, it's going to be class C and D that are going to get hit very hard. Um, a average person in a class C apartment only has $400 in the bank, where an average person in a class B has more than $2,000 in the bank. Plus, the massive percentage of job loss, those people live in class Cs and Ds. Mm. The people that live in Bs are working for companies that have promised to pay them. And, and you know, so the white collar people have not gotten laid off to uh, anywhere near the extent that the blue collar people have. The massive majority of these job losses, these 3.3 million job losses last, last uh, week, were people that live in Cs or Ds. So to me, I think that it's, it's uh, the, you know, what's gonna hurt our mobile home parks, class C, class D. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure that there's some impact on class B. I, I'm sure the impact on class A is the lowest at this point in time, because keep in mind, it's far too early for those class A people to start thinking about, oh, I'm gonna sell my, my, my home or I can't afford to live in class A, I need to switch to class B. That stuff took six months to nine months to happen in 2008. How can it happen immediately? Some people would say that a lot of people that are in the class C's are in the essential worker category and that there's a lot more of them that are actually still working because mm -hmm. their jobs qualify as essential workers. So that's one thing um, as what well. What do you think, Hunter? So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. There's a lot of service industries that are still alive and well. The construction business, mm -hmm. there's usually enough space between the workers so that there's a lot of construction still taking place despite everything else basically being frozen. The challenge, though, uh, to Neil's point, is that if you miss a payment, if you miss a two-week uh, income or a one month of income and you have only two weeks of expenses like many yeah, people do, you know, I think the average employee in the United States makes $30,000 a year. You know, this is why we've been focusing on low income and mobile home park housing for quite some time. So 
there's been an adage and a thesis that in a correction, the low income housing and low income products tend to perform well. It's certainly true, but that's looking over a graph that includes multiple years. If you look at a short term, the, the pain is felt in the short term in low incomes because missing a payment, missing an income payment is really devastating. So I think we'll see that thesis play out the way it has historically, but over the short term, you can certainly feel some pain. That's why it's so important that real estate owners provide that flexibility when they're in a position to do so. Um, ben, can you talk about self-storage in RV parks comparing like 2008 and what we might expect in the 2020 recession, assuming we're going to have one? Not, not necessarily in the Odessa market, but you know, in general. In general. Yeah, so, so looking at RV parks in general, it, RV parks tend to be more recreation focused than living focused. So uh -huh. in the middle of Odessa area, we think of that as housing, alternative housing, low income, uh, not even low income housing, but just alternative housing products. And there is no stickiness element to it. No job, they're out. On the recreation side, um, social distancing, not being able to get on a plane. Uh, I think that RV parks are about to experience uh, a mini boon. I don't know how long the boon will last, but I think that um, all the data from the KOA over the last five years is the only five years that the KOA uh, Campgrounds Something Association has been collecting data, says that the growth rate, especially with millennials and Gen Z, uh, which you'd be surprised about, of people who are taking three or more camping trips per year is massive. And that's yeah. specifically within a 50 mile radius of uh, any major metro area. So. I think for folks who are focusing on RV parks, that is not Spartan at this time. They are about to experience a boom. Um, but I'll say that I just don't think that RV parks are starting with the capitalization rate that compensates for the risk in general. So yeah, if you're point. wrong with that thesis, um, all you're left with is some dirt and some utility poles, right? Yeah. You're not, you don't have replacement costs that can be somewhat equal to your income valuation. And if you're operating at an eight to 10, even a 12% cap rate, I just don't know that the, uh, the, the risk is there. Though I do think that the income is going to grow substantially in 2020 specifically. I just don't think it's gonna be long lasting income to impact the income based valuation of RV parks. On the storage side, um, you know, we're not really seeing the same ramifications at the property level and the illiquid securities as we are at the REIT level. Um, I, mean, I was talking to Extra Space uh, just two days ago um, good friends with the uh, head of their, uh, their lending arm on the west side of the, the, um, the country. And, um, you know, their, their, their stock was down 35%, rebounded to, to 22, 20, 25% down. Um, and they're certainly not going to have the same level of rent increases that they expected in their performance in 2020. Yeah. But we're not seeing a 23% reduction in our valuations based off of an income basis or even a replacement cost. Um, I think right now the biggest lag for storage is just not being able to increase rents at the rate that you might thought, almost more out of compassion than out of necessity, um, it feels like, at, at the moment at least. But to, to, uh, to Hunter's point, you know, May 1st may be a different story. This first round of uh, collections might be a different story. Um, but we'd already made the decision that, hey, we're going to delay all of our planned rent increases for 90 days. As far as the, um, the, the buy-sell landscape, the listing opportunity or the, the buying opportunities have dried up in anticipation of things not being exciting, which has almost had the opposite effect as what you might think. The stabilized storage facilities are getting a lot more attention and they're almost trading for higher than what I would, or, or I shouldn't say trading, securing contracts at a price that's slightly higher than what I would have anticipated 30 days ago. So we're actually seeing on the stabilized side of cell storage, um, uh, an increase in price slightly. On the lease up side of storage, the, the facilities that have just been built or in the process of being leased up, we are seeing a cap rate expansion there about 25 to 75 basis points. So there is more opportunity there, um, but it's just way too early to tell if that yeah. is an adequate change for the risk. I think to, to Neil's point earlier, all advice on this webinar, on any other webinar, has a shelf life of about eight days equal to the incubation rate, right? We're not that's why we're doing them weekly. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly right. Um, you know, we're not doing enough testing in America to have an idea of what's actually happening and where this is going to take us. You know, yeah. yesterday, I think, was the first time that the U.S., you, you could probably correct me on this if I'm wrong, you know, the U.S. had a, a lower infection increase than the day before. But that's right. I was reading articles yesterday. Who knows if that's from lack of tests or mm -hmm. because we're actually bending the curve. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's not enough testing data to really predict where this is going to go. But so far, self-storage seems to be fairly insulated at the... Uh, at the non-publicly traded arena. 
Um, great. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to have Hunter and Neil chip in on uh, kind of what, what Ben was touching on. And do you recommend buying deals? Um, and are you, are you, do you recommend waiting? How are you adjusting your numbers as you're looking at deals? Well, I'll go first because my answer is very simple. For the most part, no. Um, I, I think that there's, there's exceptions to every rules. It makes sense to do that uh, in certain cases. But for the most part, uh, we're looking at the next 30 days as a kind of a holiday almost in terms of new deals and new offers. So it's very unlikely that we'll make any offers in the next 30 days. This is moving so quickly that 30 days, which seems like a very small amount of time normally, is an eternity when it comes to this crisis. Yeah, I agree. Look, you're looking at a webinar full of people that got into real estate because of the, the freedom it allowed, but yeah. also you're looking at a webinar full of people that have decided to not take all those vacations that we thought we were going to take. And we all work 60 hour weeks and we yeah. love buying real estate. And I promise you, it's a massive question mark. It's a massive pause right now. The one thing that we love to do, the one thing that actually makes the cash register ring is purchasing and selling and trading and doing real estate deals but it's a massive pause right now. I'll give you an example. We have a, a senior living property, which we're currently not under contract for, but late stages in due diligence, right? If there's 10 stages of due diligence for prior to the contract being signed, we're in stage nine. Mm -hmm. And that space is something I'm extremely bullish on over the long term for all the reasons I'm sure a lot of your listeners and the, the attendees are familiar with. But when it comes down to it, if you're looking at a revenue stream and you're going to try to retrade, what's the discount? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. What is yeah. the appropriate, okay, well now we have coronavirus. Well, ask for a, I don't know, 16% discount. I mean, that's a discount. Based what? on what? <laughs> exactly, that income is not as reliable as it once was, nor do we actually know where the market was. So if we're going to go to our investor base and say, truthfully, we got a discount to market, we have to allow the market price to be established prior to moving forward with the purchase. Mm -hmm. um, like Neil said, there are of course exceptions to any rule, but at this point we're pausing on all due diligence, not to mention the fact we can't actually go to the property, you know, yeah. wide There's that. going to a senior living property right yeah. now because the, the fear of contagion is at all time highs. And within that sector, obviously the, the tenants are higher risk. And so you don't want to be the cause of something going massively wrong. So I think that Neil's advice of any kind of extension, don't look for a, a price correction because the question is to what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you guys have anything to add to, to this question, what physical and economic vacancies should be underwritten with the economy's current trajectory? Can you want to just lob one out there? You have anything to That's lob the out challenge. there? That's yeah. the challenge, right? Because it's a question mark. You know, I talked to an operator that has about billion dollars of multifamily, a lot of respect for uh, Gelt is the name of the company. And he said, look, Hunter, I can tell you with a high degree of confidence during April 1st, we're expecting somewhere between 10 and 60% of our tenants not to pay rent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, no idea. look at his point, right? Yeah. 10 and 60. <laughs> Why would you want us to give you numbers like that when you know that we're, we're not, we are beyond the realm of wild ass scientific guessing here. Yeah. We are beyond that realm, right? Exactly. So let's talk about uh, what happens if tenants can't pay rent. Let's talk about that. Who wants to jump in on that one? Oh God. Um, how long, right? That's uh, the, the key question is how long I expect that between 10 and 30% of my tenants in my apartment complexes are not going to pay rent for the month of April. Mm -hmm. And it could be worse than that. But I think that the apartment industry is slightly insulated in, in a number of cases, simply because, you know, roof over your head. Uh, it's not clear that we are not allowed to evict, even though I believe that evictions cannot be processed at the time, this time with no sheriff coming out. But you can actually start eviction processes yes. in a number of counties in the US, which the tenants are aware of. By the way, we've made sure <laughs> that they are aware of that, that we can ding their credit and we can, we can start the, the process of evicting them, even though can, we can't physically get them out. If, but but let's think, just clarify that, that if they are not paying rent be, uh, and they, they don't have any reason that's related to COVID-19. Right. So, that's right. so if, if somebody is experiencing hardships related to coronavirus and, and their, their job, that's one thing. But yeah. we're, you know, we all, let, all us landlords are concerned about people taking advantage of this. Correct. And, and I think that once they, once we go through that process of, okay, show us exactly what has happened to your job, 
I think it's going to come come in somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. The question, yeah. you know, if you're not capitalized enough to take that hit for one month or two months or three months, then you weren't running your property correctly anyway. So That's to me, true. I think that the one month, two month, three month time frame is is not an issue. Uh, right before this webinar, I was reading the 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 two page document that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac wrote yeah. about their uh, loan abatement program or forbearance program where we can basically push out our mortgage and our taxes and all those kinds of things by 90 days. I wouldn't want to go on to that forbearance. There's yeah. downsides of it. But if I have to, so what? I mean, I think that it's going to end up happening if, if we can't kill this thing by the end of May or, or bring some level of sanity in by the end of May. So my answer is, if it's two months, we have a huge number of options. Vast majority of our, uh, our, our uh, apartment communities qualify for loans. Keep in mind that apart from the free money that the tenants are being gifted, there's also small business loans that we qualify for. So we yes. can go and get those small business loans, which actually are more flexible than what Fannie and Freddie are offering. And then if, if the, you don't want to take those loans, you can always get mortgage abatement from Fannie and Freddie for another 90 days and then go back and get those small business loans because they're still available three months from now. So those loans are available for 12 months. So you've got a number of options yes. to execute. But I think the biggest thing is that you've got to make, you work very closely with your tenants because I think we are still, we have the ability to bring that default rate down from let's say 40, 40 or 50% down to 20 or 30% because I think there's, there's gonna be a lot of frivolous non-payment and we have to execute properly to make sure that we don't get that frivolous non-payment. Hunter? Hunter? I mean, I just want to add, this is a good highlight between our conversation regarding the difference between 2001, 2008, and today, where we have this liquidity in the marketplace and it's available, right? And it's not short-sighted. I mean, this is to the tune of trillions of dollars. And those small business loans, we've looked into the terms of those, not for myself, but for my wife's company. And there's a lot of options out there. So if that flexibility can be provided, it will be provided. And let's not forget that similar to the way that anytime a crisis happens, people tend to prepare for that crisis and it's never that crisis again. Like when Katrina sure happened, all yeah. everyone started buying was water. It's like, well, yeah. now our water is running all over the world. So that's not gonna help you against coronavirus. Similarly, People want to prepare for 2008 when that was a wild aberration, not only in terms of the lack of liquidity, but in terms of the fact that real estate took a 30% dive. That is basically unheard of. I mean, you look at 2001, real estate basically took a breath and that was it. They moved on with their lives. So real estate is an incredibly stable asset that's predominantly driven by rental income, which for the most part is very stable. And so we're well positioned. That's why we all enjoy this beautiful asset class. We are at the point where we're going to start taking um, questions from the audience. Um, we did have a few questions that were written in um, right before via email during the day. So no more through email. The only ones I'm taking are through the Q&A channel, not the chat channel, the Q&A box. Um, I've got one, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a Ben question, but we haven't heard you chime in for a bit, Ben. So um, what, would, what impact would an increase in the number of mortgage margin calls for lenders have on the general CRE market? One more time. Run that by me one more time. Mortgage what? margin calls. They're talking about the fact that the lenders are requiring 12 months of interest, you know, uh, impounds now on all new projects. So you have to basically pay 12 months of interest up front as part of your equity. Uh, frankly, I don't know. I'm oh, gonna, so maybe, Neil, that's a better people. one for you to handle. Yeah. We've been looking into that. And uh, my honest answer is I believe that that's short term. I think if you're looking to buy properties in the next 90 days, if you underwrite using that money in your equity, then you're shortchanging yourself because I think that that goes away. I, I don't think that it, you, know, you would see that next year. So what you're doing is you know, they're forcing you to raise more equity now. And I, I'm all, all, almost focused on trying to get, if I, if I have an apartment complex that I'm buying today and I'm being forced to basically get 12 months of you know, interest payment and add that to my equity, I'm more interested in doing short-term loans. So, so creating a separate tranche where you know, we still raise the same exact amount of equity that we were raising in February, but adding this amount as a one-year loan with a one-year extension, yeah. because otherwise when you raise that much equity, you're gonna be, I mean, you're not gonna be able to buy 
but the overall effect of that is not everybody has the database to be able to raise those loans. So in the short term, I believe that you will see cap rates go, go up because of that. Um, because, um, I mean, obviously, having to raise that extra on a $20 million project, you have to raise $100,000 a month, which is $1.2 million of extra equity. So obviously that lowers returns. If it lowers returns, it's gonna increase cap rates. So I think in the short run, three, four, five, six months, you're gonna see an increase in cap rates because of that margin call. Um, so let's see, we've got, Neil, I had one for you that before we go to the, the other questions, so we know that you've been posting about the coronavirus and its spread and analyzing the, day, the daily data. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we stand? Are we facing Armageddon or are we gonna beat this thing? Um, we're gonna beat this thing easily. I, in my mind, and when I say easily, I believe that we're on the right path. So Ben brought this up and Ben said, it's only been one day, Ben. It yes. hasn't been one day because you know, a lot of people are like, oh, but we don't know about the testing. You know, we could be doing more testing than some other countries or some other states. But when you take a look at everyone's graph, and we, that's what we do. We, we have a website called coronavirusrealestate.com, and we are mapping eight different countries' tracks there every single day. Here's what I can tell you, Ben. It's not that we're over-testing or under-testing. Everyone's under-testing to some extent. But our track, our curve, is almost identical to seven other countries that we're tracking on coronavirusrealestate.com. Yesterday was a key number because the United States did not see an increase in terms of number of infected people from the day before. So we had 19,000 people, new infections the day before, and we had 19,000 yesterday. And even though that we've only had one day so far, there's a huge amount of curved data that was leading up to it that suggested that it would happen yesterday and it did. So the bottom line is, at this point, the big X factor that has been removed in the United States was President Trump saying, we're gonna reopen the economy on Easter. Now that he's taken that away to 30 days, if I project the current curve out 30 days, we're in a pretty good position. We're not gonna lose millions of people because that millions of people dying would, would damage our economy for an extended period of time. I think that we, it ends up being tens of thousands of deaths, which is a horrific number but keep in mind that the flu killed 60,000 people in 2018, right? Yeah. So, that, so the, the, you, you have to basically look at it that way. I, I feel at this point in time, yes, we're gonna beat this. I just hope that there isn't Hunter Thompson's two punch, that second, yeah, punch. The second punch. If we don't get the second punch in the month of April, if we don't get second punch in the month of May, we'll see a stabilization of the economy in June. Um, so we've got somebody who's curious what Hunter and Ben think, they've already heard Neil's input, about the potential for inflation and hyperinflation due to the mass injection of capital from the government into the market. Hmm. So I'll jump in. So basically, this is something that, you know, in the libertarian world, which I'm a philosophical libertarian, not a political libertarian, I don't really participate in the political space, but in the libertarian world, uh, money printing equals inflation. Now, there's a difference between the dilution of the money value and the actual rise in prices, but to understand what's going on globally is to understand that hyperinflation is not a legitimate concern. And I know that is a bold statement for someone who is an advocate of free money, but the way this works is that look at the bond yields. The United States bonds, there is legitimate demand for those bonds. And the reason is that they're the prettiest girl in the ugly contest or whatever, however you want to say it. There's a tremendous amount of demand for those bonds. And this is why, you know, Japan, for example, has negative interest rates. There's a massive $17 trillion negative interest rate market in the world. And as long as there's demand for those bonds, you do not see hyperinflation. Now, the big question is, when does that go away? And for most people, it must be replaced by something. So if all of a sudden you stop seeing demand for US dollars and started seeing demand for the Chinese currency, which most people consider to be number two, then you will start to see that massive, massive challenge. But if you look at the debt to GDP ratio of Japan, for example, and compare it to the debt to GDP ratio of the United States, you see how long this circus can go on. It's much longer than most people think. And even if you have an ideological uh, viewpoint, like I certainly do, you have to look at the facts, compare uh, Japan's debt to GDP is like 300 and something percent. The United yep. States is nowhere near a third of that. So that's just the reality of the situation. 
I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Hunter. I have nothing to debate him against that. I'll just add <laughs> back to the conversation, you know, to the point about having demand for the US dollar. If you look at the number of countries, or rather the global reserve currency of the world, 60% of all uh, deposits and reserves are held in the US dollar. And I think the, the, the and, and it might be more now, I don't know, is it, is it more now, Hunter? You're probably tracking that better than I am. And the percentage of trade that's done in the US dollar is in the high 80s to low 90s oftentimes. So as long as these currencies are still being used and hoarded by the entire world, as, as, as long as everybody has economic buy into the US dollar, we can print and inject as much as we want and we will not experience the same type of hyperinflation that other countries would. Yes. One, one additional point. That's exactly right. So I have to say two points on that because I don't want to, number one, I don't want to be disavowed by my libertarian friends, but I also want to be honest. When this money printing starts, the inclination of people who are advocates of free market is to scream, the dollar is going to be trashed soon. Buy gold. And if there's one thing I don't like, it's when people say the absolute opposite of what's true. Because what really ends up happening when there's massive money printing, it happens to coincide with massive recessions. And when massive recessions happen, especially global panics, people buy the dollar. So in the short term, especially, we anticipate seeing a rise in the dollar value, which is completely- Which opposite. we've already seen. I mean, we're, we're already yeah. beginning to see that. That if anything, the percentage of people running towards the dollar in this recession, and I, I believe we are in a recession, by the way, is higher than 2008 because the 2008 recession was actually caused by the United States, by our real estate market imploding. And so there were a number of people that believed that we may not get out of it. So there, were, there was some interest in, in you know, looking at other currencies and buying other currencies. But yeah. right now, the, the, the US currency and treasury bonds are incredibly popular right now. I mean, everybody right. wants to buy treasury bonds. Um, by the way, I've just about. launched a poll for those of you that are um, attending. We've got a little poll, so please fill that out. Give us a, an idea, uh, to answer a few simple questions for us. This is for everybody. Um, how do you see investor appetite changing following this correction? Do you see a tangible downturn in LP enthusiasm and limited partner enthusiasm for, for buying, for investing in deals? Yeah, I can start with that one. Um, and I think this kind of ties into an earlier question that was asked, which is, are you buying? Because yeah. you need resources to buy. So I've actually, I want to use this as an opportunity to present a different argument than Neil and Hunter uh, presented. And there's a spectrum of opinion on that question uh, it, at Spartan Investment Group, but it, it's, it's a narrow spectrum of opinion. And personally, um, you know, we're, we're looking at this as a, somewhat of a blue ocean market in some niches of our, of our asset class. And so there's a difference between purchasing and transacting and controlling contracts. So we are as aggressive as always. Um, I shouldn't say as aggressive as always, but we're not taking our foot off the gas and looking for opportunities. And we're using the pandemic as a a righteous way to say, listen, we're here, we're ready to play ball. We want to get this data in the hands of our lenders who don't have too much to do if they're actually doing some stuff right now. <laughs> and we want to get this in the hands of our equity investors who want to hear what we're up to when nobody else has too much to do. So we've got the debt markets, the equity markets, and the space markets all on pause. And we're planning on navigating that, not to transact, not to incorporate and accept the risk of the pandemic, but to take control of it and to eventually mitigate, transfer, or avoid the risk altogether if we, just, if we do decide that the risk is too much for the price that we've established. Um, and everyone wants to be a squatter. He wants to squat on a huge amount of assets. That's absolutely <laughs> and see, right. what, see what happens. But, but, but I want to do that by uh, telling the sellers this in advance. You know, they have options. I'm, I'm being completely transparent with the approach, which is why I'm willing to say it on this call. Um, as far as investor appetite, uh, we haven't seen a huge slowdown yet, but we're also cognizant of the fact um, that a lot of investors just lost 30, 40%. And at in our space, market. the retail investor world, uh, in the stock market, yeah, yeah, of, of some of their uh, other portfolio. Yeah. In the retail investor world, they tend to lag a little bit behind institutional investors, so they make their decisions a little bit more slowly. So we look at who lost the most in the you know, higher net worth arena. It's the folks with the lowest net worth who we are building relationships with today. So we are um, doubling down on resources now uh, to accommodate for the potential lack of appetite, but we also don't really have a deal flow for them to start investing in today. So it's a bit difficult to gauge. Mm -hmm. Hunter, your thoughts? 
You know, I actually want to turn it back to you, but I'm going to paraphrase. Recently, Neil and I had a conversation about this, and I think that he's done a very good job of being honest about this situation. It's so important. If those that are attending are also real estate entrepreneurs, not just investors, it's an incredible time to put out honest, authentic information that you actually believe so that you can guide your investors in a very uncertain time. And this webinar is a perfect example of that. I can tell you, before we got on, Neil and Anna didn't say, now, listen, don't say anything negative because this is a big opportunity. For us. <laughs> they want to know. I mean, one of the reasons that we want to have this conversation, we all want to learn from each other, but yeah. we're all confident that we're going to come out on the right end of this. When it comes to communicating with investors, trust me, if you're used to raising $1 million or $2 million, anticipate being able to raise a third of that on your next raise. Because despite Great. all the information and despite about how many times your investor base said, boy, I cannot wait for a 20% discount. When it happens, they always say, but not like this. Every yeah. time there's a recession, that's not what they meant. They just thought it was going to be like, hey, great deal. And the reality is it's more like my sister lost her job. That's what yeah, a buying opportunity hard. sounds like. Yeah. So you have to position your investor base to prepare for that emotionally. Emotional stability is the name of the game when dealing with this stuff. I think the biggest thing for me has been is communicating with my investors, not necessarily telling them, are you ready to invest now? I think that it is about communication and helping them get over the freeze that investors are in right now. Because I feel like they're frozen. And we've seen some instances of that investors just coming to us and backing out of existing deals simply because their mind is frozen. And I, what I find is that, you know, maybe you'll get one third of the money. And I think that one third, a hunter's really on point there with, you know, you probably will raise one third of the money. But my feedback is you'll probably end up raising more than one third if you can successfully unfreeze them and make them understand we're not in a recession. We're in the greatest hurricane of all time. They, and the key thing is if you study any hurricane in the past, once they go, everything returns to normalcy far faster than any recession in history. So once they understand that we're in a recession, I think that you will unfreeze your investors but, uh, but if you don't do that, I think that, yes, you'll end up raising 25 to 30% of the money that you were used to raise. Yeah, we'll uh, let's talk about interest rates. You guys want to chime in on what, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, obviously the feds dropped it to zero, but we're not seeing the interest rates come down yet. So there's risk being, there's risk out there. And how does, how does this all play out? I, we've been doing a ton of uh, debt acquisition in the last 30 days outside of this whole ecosystem occurring. So I've had the, uh, the pleasure of being on the phone with quite a few bankers lately. Um, anybody who is being securitized or, or is trying to sell off their, their institutional debt to the CLO market for liquidity, they're just, they're done. Their pencils down, they're frozen until there is liquidity again. Anybody who's keeping something on their balance sheet, it's a bit more of a, how are they assessing the risk? If they're thinking of this as a hurricane and they're seeing blue ocean opportunity to lend, you know, to maybe get some operators. I know people who are being told by their bosses to pick up the phone and start selling themselves as a lender right now, which is the opposite of what you might think. And then you've got the folks who are saying, we're pencils down for the next 45 days. Don't even worry about calling me. Yeah. Um, at the local bank level, it's the same kind of mix because folks are keeping uh, more stuff on their balance sheet. They're a lot better capitalized at the local bank level. Their balance sheets are a lot fuller. And so while they might be incorporating the risk into their proceeds or into the recourse, anything that's not non-recourse right now is an absolute non-starter, they're still lending. Um, so the availability of capital is there. You just have to know exactly where to look and, and be willing to make a few more phone calls. Um, on the interest rate side, I'm seeing a huge range of where people are putting their floors, anywhere from, at least at the local banks, 375 to 525. I mean, that's the widest spread in, wow. in interest rate floors I've seen, despite the fact that the, the federal funds rate is at a, a quarter point. So um, most people are not moving their floors. They're waiting to see what their competition is going to do. So it's not that they're not going to drop rates. It's that they don't see a reason to do it yet. Um, there's yeah. not enough competition to drop the rates yet. Yeah, so the exactly. spreads have been, been, are being pushed out, despite the fact that um, the, the federal funds rate is dropping, only because nobody's exactly sure what, nobody wants to be the first mover in dropping the floor. So, you know. Right. I mean, you're overpaying right now because there's no competition. And I, I know that local banks are going to come in. I know that CMBS is going to come in and, and be more aggressive. 
because right now, because of the freeze, everyone's floor is too high. It doesn't match the Fed Fund's funds rate. So in my mind, if you're locking in right now, you're you're overpaying. But but to you know, Ben, I'm seeing things that are different from what you're seeing. I see I'm seeing local banks being very uh, aggressive. We received a post coronavirus quote on a small, very small new construction project that we're doing at 4.75%. Yeah. So that bank that? had adjusted their reality to a Fed funds rate that's zero, right? 4.75% verified, signed by the bank's boss, right? The big boss of the bank two days ago. So I think what is happening is we are in this 30 to 45 day time frame where nobody knows where the floor is. So you might get three radically different quotes from three radically different sources. So right now is a great time to shop the quotes because nobody has any clue what the market price should be. Yeah. Hunter, you want to chip in on that? I know you like well high interest rates. <laughs> yeah, well said. I think it's, you know, it's a matter of the beauty, and though I scoff at thinking that the banking sector is a relatively free market, but the beauty of the fact that competition is there, there will be those greedy bankers that want to get those deals done. So they will drop rates once things return to some sort of normalcy. Yeah. Um, do you have restructuring rent ideas for tenants? I do. <laughs> My Go prediction is that uh, folks are going to start looking at terms like financial aid. So, you know, right now the tools in everybody's toolkit are promotions and rent drops mm -hmm. and both suck because promotions aren't going to work right now. Nobody can come to your store and rent drops are going to say, all right, well, if I've got half of my, half of my attendee base able to afford it, or excuse my, uh, my tenant base, excuse me, able to afford the rent and half that's not, if I drop my rents, I have to drop it for everybody. So the way to kind of dynamically price, not your new customers, but your existing customers is to use frameworks like what higher education does and say, let me price differentiate in a legal way. So I, I think, um, you know, I just got an email from University of Denver. They're trying to sell me, say, hey, everybody who signs up for the next cohort, $15,000 automatic scholarship for, uh, for higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you never know, could be more for you. So I, I think yeah. using terms like financial aid might come into play in the short term. Cool. Um, let's see. I wanted to then go to um, lots of similar questions here. Mm -hmm. So can Hunter elaborate both short versus long-term scenario for class C and D tenants? How is C and D performing well in the long term? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at the historical data, Class B, B minus, C plus has really outperformed, generally speaking, produced the highest IRRs because of a combination of NOI growth and cap rate compression over the last 10 years in particular, uh, most notably from 2012 to 2017 or so. Um, the challenge with luxury, uh, particularly Class A, is that generally speaking, um, they tend to be more um, the return profile tends to be more subject to the valuation of that rental income. So for example, if, if you're investing in California, it's extremely pronounced because the cap rates are very, very low. Um, if mm -hmm. the multiple at which you're trading changes drastically, which it can, the volatility and the predictability of the outcome is very, very different. Um, if you're looking at a market like Memphis, Tennessee, which we talked about previously, you basically yeah. do not have much appreciation in that marketplace. When I'm talking about appreciation in this sense, I mean the multiple that people will pay for the revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So if everything trades at an eight cap in 2008, it's going to be trading at like a six cap right now. Mm -hmm. That's not a big difference. In California, let's say the outskirts of Los Angeles in the Inland Empire, for example, you could have seen rates go from a 12 cap to a six cap. So the propensity for those things to swing back to their pre you know, pre-2008 levels is much, much higher. Um, and that's true in other asset classes as well. But that's really the main thing. You're looking at a more volatile asset class that has a more likelihood of producing outsized returns when things yeah. are good and lower returns when things are slow. Um, so we have a question from a new, um, new syndicator. What is the fastest and most effective way to start marketing myself and my team as capital raisers seeking to buy our own deals or partner if we're new to the game, we've got warm investor contacts, but we haven't done any marketing or branding yet. So they're trying to set themselves up for what's coming. You know, a couple months from now, they're seeing opportunity 
but they don't currently have a, their, their brand together yet. They're, they're just, how, what, what would you suggest to people that are new to the game that want to get on, into the game three months from now as capital raisers? Can I take that one? Um, you know, I, I know Hunter probably wants to jump in. Um, you have the greatest opportunity of all time to brand yourself. Um, do you notice that, you know, there's 489 people on this webinar and there were 518, even though this is a 500 license Zoom, because for three successive webinars, we've hit 500 and locked people out. So sure. right now, if you want to talk about the impact of coronavirus on real estate, you will create a ridiculously large following. Simply learn more and, and do those webinars. You don't need a brand right now. Nobody gives a damn. You have an astonishingly large branding opportunity right in front of you in your lap today where all you really have to do is write down your thoughts about what you believe and go start doing webinars. And you will notice that the number of people that are going to show up is going to be absolute insanity. I mean, again, four webinars in a row where we've locked people out and, and, and have received nasty emails from them. Uh, it, because the amount of interest is just spectacular. So why would you have trouble branding yourself at this point in time? It's much easier than it's ever been. Yeah, I, I, I could agree more. I'll give myself a pitch, though it is a pitch for only eight bucks. I wrote a book on this topic uh, called Raising Capital for Real Estate. Mm -hmm. You can get it for free plus shipping at raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. Basically, it's a book about exactly what Neil just talked about. I failed miserably on my first, miserably, I should say, on my first capital raise. I was in a room with 30 accredited investors, all had a net worth of a million dollars. I raised a total of zero dollars after giving them a very passionate and educated speech. And I realized that it's not about trying to convert people uh, to invest with you. It's about having them line up so that you never have to do it again. And that's exactly what Neil is talking about literally being oversubscribed for a webinar multiple times in a row so that people are like, when are you going to release the RSVP list so that I can get into the next one? And that's what the book is all about. If you have some ideas on this topic, take an hour and a half to write down three articles on coronavirus. And that's the beginning of building your brand. Absolutely. And, and given that Hunter got an opportunity there to plug one of his products. So Ben, tell us where we can hear more about Spartan's products, because yeah. clearly you intend being in the market in the next few months. Yeah. So tell us how our, our viewers can find out more about your products. Well, yes, we intend to be in the markets that were in front of the debt, equity and, uh, and, and, and uh, sales marketplaces. Uh, but we're not looking to transact in Q2, just to be clear. Nobody's that great. Right. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can check us out at Spartan-Investors.com and uh, be sure to check out the best ever conference. Be That's yeah. right. Yeah. I, I can tell you this and I, I will get beaten up for saying this. My favorite conference, you can only ever have one favorite. So my, I, you know, my favorite conference has always been the best ever. It's one that I've been to a number of times. Uh, check it out. And then we, I was so happy that the best ever the timing was just perfect, right, Ben? Because yeah. just as we were leaving, that's when the phobia was growing. That's right. Um, and so the conference didn't get affected at all. So I, I was very happy. It's a tremendous conference. And pretty much everyone in the industry shows up at one event. And, and so I, I tell people that uh, it, it almost seems like the best ever is designed for me because I, it took me two and a half hours this time to get from the door. I came in a little bit late to the registration booth because I was stopped about 50 times. So I feel like, Ben gathers all of my peers together in one place so that I can have a fun time for three days. So it's it. <laughs> and I will say, I don't, I don't travel around too much for conferences myself, but the one conference I have gone to every year, other than my own, mm -hmm. because it has the best grouping of passive investors is Hunters. So I, that's I right. go to Hunters conference. conference, the Intelligent, the Intelligent Investors Real Estate Conference yeah. that's uh, right. in Los Angeles. Year, so. Incredible. I appreciate it, guys. It's actually, we're changing the name to second best ever. So. <laughs> 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 or the January best ever as opposed right, to right. the February best ever, right? <laughs> um, Neil, That's I think right. this one's for you. Is this a good time to start a construction project? Uh, why not? Um, I, as I gave you examples, I think this is, this is a good time to start construction projects because think about it. I mean, this, it, 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 the initial answer for almost everybody is no, no, it must be a horrible time. Okay, so you're doing a construction project. We're lenders, and I gave you an exact example. There's local lend lenders willing to give you construction loans under 5%, and you're, you're completely disconnected from the marketplace that's happening today. 
you know, my value added communities are going to see massive rent drops in the next three or four months, but you're going to actually going to deliver a project that either gets delivered a year and a half from now or two years from now, when all of this madness will be done for better or for worse, will be done with. So the big question is, of course you want to do construction projects, but can you raise the money? Yeah. And, and frankly, I, I, I don't know that a, a lot of our projects are going to be given the choice. All of the county offices are shut down. We got our site development plan. We were a couple of weeks from building permits on an expansion and they're, they're, we're, we're not getting that, those building permits until they open the office again. We're just in, you're just in the wrong states. Um, right, yeah, some yeah, of yeah. the states that we are in have con deemed we're construction as, uh, as uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. Construction, yes. Construction is necessary, but not the permit and planning offices. That's right. That's right. That is going to be a challenge. That, that is a very challenging piece of it. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, we just have this one about the loans, the FHA and the, the Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the, the um, what are the possibilities with the forbearance? Um, do you want to speak to that? Anyone want to speak to what the programs are and what it could mean for property owners? So outside my area of expertise, yeah. You know. So I'll, I'll go because I, I started reading this before the event. Um, so Fannie and Freddie have issued these two-page guidelines that essentially say, um, if your loan was already in good standing, then you can apply for a 90-day extension and um, it, to, to that loan. And you can include not just the mortgage, but also the real estate taxes and the insurance. You, know, you basically don't have to pay anything to them that you were paying. But you have to be able to prove to them that you're hurt. That, and, and to do so, I don't believe that anyone can apply until April rents come in. Because there's very few, few people in the world that can actually prove that their rents were hurt in March. Right? So, so in my mind, nothing happens in April with this forbearance stuff. We have to wait until May. And so then we can take our February pay, uh, pay, uh, payroll, uh, sorry, our, our rent uh, roll, and then match it up with our April rent roll and say, hey, we've been hurt. And then we can basically start applying to Fannie and Freddie. So it's a 90 day process. Doesn't look like it hurts your credit. And we're still verifying on that. But, but, um, but the, the challenge of course is during the time that you're in forbearance, that entire 90 day time frame, you cannot evict anyone, right? Just anyone. I mean, and they're not saying you can't evict people that have lost their jobs. They're saying, even if somebody decides just not to pay you, you still can't evict them. Even though that you know that they're just, you know, frivolous, um, you know, people, you still can't evict them. And then there's this other clause that people are talking about that I haven't seen anywhere in the documents where they're saying that, until you pay that money back, you can't evict anybody. So if you pay, you know, pay the, those three months back over the next 15 months, you can't evict anybody. I have not found any evidence of that in the, in the actual document, so I'm still looking for it. But lenders are providing a central contact, so no matter who your Fannie or Freddie you know, lender is, they're providing a central contact that'll give you more information. You should be approaching them, you should be talking with them now, even though your chances of getting that forbearance in April are pretty much 0%. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have three quick things to, to wrap us up. What was the website location for Hunter's book again, please? Oh, yeah. And again, I appreciate the, uh, the question, the opportunity. So it's raisingcapitalforrealestate.com. We tried to give away a thousand copies. Those were gone. So now we're giving away the first 5,000 copies to so run over there and get it for free. So raising capital for, for real estate. For real estate.com. Okay. Um, on your blurb, you said the question of where the $2 trillion is coming from would be addressed. Have not heard anything about that yet. Where, where does the source, where is this $2 trillion coming from? <laughs> Midair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Congress has the ability to print money. I mean, uh, we, you know, we, we just simply print up treasury bonds. Um, I think we've done it before. We're doing it again. Uh, keep in mind that we do have a trillion dollar deficit. So Printing money is something that comes easy to Congress. Uh, and then we, our last request, please spell Ben's Spartan website again. Sure. <laughs> uh, S-P-A-R-T-A-N dash investors with, that's an S at the end, investors.com. Great. Awesome. Well, that, my friends, is a wrap. What a fun uh, town hall this was. And I, yes, and I wanted to plug to before we go, I wanted to plug the fact that we're going to be doing this every week and we're going to have different focuses each week. So uh, a bunch of you sent your questions in I, and I think we covered most of those. Yes. But next week is going to be a different focus. We certainly will bring you more Fannie Freddie type information next week because we'll have more time 
uh, by then and, and will be in, in April so that we will have some, um, some focus on there. But I'll, we will also next week focus on how much rent did we get in the first yeah. week of April? So uh, we get to do this town hall again next week. And given that 500 of you and how many, I don't know how many more showed up that we couldn't take in, uh, we hope to see you again in a, in a week for, uh, for another entertaining town hall. But uh, I wanted to thank uh, Hunter and thank Ben for, for being here with us. And thank you so much, Anna, for putting this whole thing together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hunter and, and, and Ben. Glad to thank have you. Thank you guys. I really us. appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.